The key to being successful in the civil engineering world is one word, adaptability. And in this episode of the Civil Engineering CEO, I have with me Ring Lardner. Ring is the president at Davis, Bowen, and Friedel. And Ring is gonna talk about how we need to be adaptable as an engineer, as a firm, and as an industry if we're gonna grow to our full potential. Before I jump in with Ring, a quick word from our sponsor for this episode, Pannoni. Since Pannoni's founding more than five decades ago, their clients trust Pannoni's commitment to elevating the impact of projects in the communities they serve. By partnering with their clients, they establish relationships that create trust and longevity. Pannoni approaches the start of every project as the beginning of a collaboration. With the rapid change in technology, Pannoni's clients know they are getting innovative methods in delivering quality services for smart, sustainable, and resilient solutions. Pannoni is relentless in their aim to bring fresh perspective and new technologies. Pannoni measures achievement in innovation, efficiency, and excellence. Its milestones are bigger than any one project, and every project affects the community, no matter how large or small. For more information, visit Pannoni.com. That's P-E-N-N-O-N-I dot com. Right, now I'd like to welcome our guest onto the show today. Ring Lardner is the president at Davis, Bowen, and Fridell. Ring, welcome to the Civil Engineering CEO. Thank you very much. Glad to be here. All right. So Ring, let's get going with your company. Tell us about the company, where you're located, of course, your role, number of offices, employees. Sure. So uh, we are a multidiscipline engineering firm, uh, primarily focusing on surveying, engineering, and architecture. Um, and within the uh, breadth of civil engineering, we offer traffic engineering, structural engineering. Uh, we also have um, coastal engineering. Um, pretty much it's a, it's a one-stop shop here uh, with Davis Bone and Friedel. Uh, the only thing we do not offer in-house would be environmental um, opportunities and mechanical electrical plumbing. So pretty much it's a, it's a soup to nuts type of firm uh, for projects for our clients. Uh, the firm was founded in 1983 by two engineers. It was John Davis and Jerry Friedel uh, is who first um, joined the firm together, known as Davis and Associates. And then a few months later, an architect named John Bowen joined the firm uh, to create the architectural engineering experience. And they were then renamed themselves Davis, Bowen and Friedel. And that was founded in Salisbury, uh, where our corporate office still exists today, just in a different uh, location. Then in the early 90s, um, to spread our experience and abilities. We opened an office in Delaware, uh, Dover to be exact. Um, and then from there, we moved into Milford, where we're currently situated right now. So our second office is in, in Milford, Delaware. Um, and then in the 2007, we acquired a firm called Andrews Millers and Associates to further expand our abilities uh, into the coastal engineering market, some enhanced mm -hmm. surveying. Um, and then ultimately in 2009, we consolidated into Easton, Maryland, where our third office is located um, so that we have pretty much the Delmarva Peninsula covered. Each office is within one hour of each other uh, so that we're geo um, located amongst the peninsula. That's kind of where we focus uh, most of our efforts and work in that location. We're sitting about 110 employees. It, it varies depending on some interns and the like with about 40 or so in Milford, 40 or so in Salisbury, and then the other 10 or so in our Eastern office. Um, currently, I'm one of five partners of the firm um, and recently named president of the company in July of this year. That's great. And it's interesting to hear you kind of go through that and hear about, you know, the growth and the footprint uh, of the firm, you know, maybe adding some strategic services, making sure that the offices aren't too far apart. So you have that kind of, you know, like you said, you're geolocated, good strategy there. So that's interesting. And and, you know, congratulations on being named president, of course. Let's talk about that a little bit. I think, you know, a lot of engineers, when they start their careers, they may not be thinking about, you know, where they're going to be 10, 15, 20 years from now. Um, in terms of your own career path and progression, was becoming a president or a high-level executive in a company something that you had a goal of, or did you just kind of go through your career and it, and it came out to that point? I went through my career. I mean, I've always wanted to be an engineer my entire life. I've known that my dad was a mechanical engineer. So I always enjoyed what he was doing. 
Um, he had some great opportunities in his life. So I, I knew I wanted to be an engineer, thought I wanted to be a mechanical engineer, kind of found out that's not exactly what was for me. So while I was taking classes at, at the University of Delaware, where I, I got my degree from, I took classes geared towards some engineering, stormwater management, some, some design of that. Like I kind of in, enjoyed it. Um, and I was taking a thermodynamics class and my instructor at the time talked about professional licensing. And I had never heard of anything about a professional license and, until then. He's like, well, I recommend before you all graduate to go take your, your fundamentals of engineering exam, the FE exam, as we all, we all well know, before you graduate or soon after graduation, um, so that if you decide in the future to take your professional engineering, if that's the path you want to take, you've already completed that test. And I'm glad he mentioned that because I wouldn't even thought that was an opportunity because it wasn't really discussed very well in, in school. So once I, I, I got you know, here at Davis Bowen and Friedel, uh, I joined here in October of 2003. Uh, I, I was a staff engineer and I knew about licensing, knew about partners, but they, again, at that point, I wasn't aspiration. I was there to do my job and figured my job were, you know, those things would then allow the future growth in the company. So that's kind of how it's gone is my, my career path took me to here today. It wasn't one of those I had a vision when I first started. Interesting. And that comment that you made about the professor, it just goes to show you, you know, whether it's professors or guidance counselors, when you're in college, you just don't know what you don't know. So, you know, getting any kind of information or, you know, mentorship or guidance or advice from people can be very valuable because we see this all the time at EMI. I mean, we have a couple of YouTube channels past the FE exam and past the PE exam to help engineers on that journey. But like someone has to let you know that that even exists for you to be able to capitalize on that. So if you're out there and you're, you know, you're not sure about the licensing process, I, I encourage you to look into it because to me, a license is extremely valuable because for a lot of reasons that I think some are obvious, but once you have that PE license, as long as you maintain it, no one can really take that away from you. And it can be very valuable to where you can go in your career. So I definitely would recommend for our listeners to really think through that. So Ring, if I were to ask your staff what your management style is, how do you think they'd answer that question? They would answer it. I think it's adaptive in, in that leadership style. And, and to, I don't have one or the other. You, you know, if you go to the formal definition of the leadership style, they have different versions. It, it's adaptive because every person's different. So one mm -hmm. leadership style may work one for one person, doesn't work well for, for another. And it's that adaptability that allows you to get the most out of your, your staff because um, in this business, we're, we're more of a consulting engineering company. So our clients are mainly developers, um, private commercial. We do have some municipal clients of the like. So they, they all have different requirements. We do demand things, but we try to find that, that style to get the most out of them because we want them to learn and grow as individuals, as staff members, because eventually they're our replacements is the way I kind of look at it. So we've got to grow them, mentor them. So it, it's that adaptability that I think is, is what helps. Uh, and I would define my leadership style to be. No, that's great. I mean, I think that actually goes right into my next question in that, you know, the last two or three years have been obviously a roller coaster ride for everybody. Um, you know, the pandemic, you know, things have been going on in the economy and for someone in your position where kind of everyone in the firm is looking to you in terms of, you know, just how to react to things, you know, um, how do you kind of make sure that you're not like overreacting to something or underreacting, like making sure that you are kind of adaptable and flexible with things. How do you, how do you try to keep that composure when people are kind of looking to you for how they should react? It's like everything else. The first reaction is not always the right reaction. Right. Um, you know, whether it's with kids or staff, it's not always the, the right reaction. So I try to stay even keel in everything that I do, but you got to know the facts to have the reaction. And when you don't know the facts, you've got to find the, the facts. Um, we all learn early on in life. You know, sometimes you count to 10. Sometimes you give it the 24 hour rule before you react, depending on what the situation is. And if you're too volatile or the, the other end of the spectrum, not 
reactive enough to show some type of emotion, your staff feeds off that energy and they kind of know how you are. So if you're always blowing up, then they may tend to come to you less with a question, a problem, an issue. And if you tend to underreact, then they may not come to you because they may have a real situation that needs to respond. So it's finding that even balance. Again, kind of goes to that leadership style. You're finding that balance that works for everybody because sometimes you do need to yell. Sometimes that's not the appropriate reaction um, to what's going on. Again, it's all part of that grooming of your subordinates because again, today you want them to come to you with a question, whether it's about a project, whether it's about their personal growth or a problem, because that's what we're here for as leaders is to help, you know, solve those problems, provide guidance, not solve it for them, but, you know, provide that guidance and direction for them. Yeah, that's great. And I like that point a lot because I think at times there are times when you do need to stay calm. If there's something that could potentially panic your team and, you know, you don't want to get them panicked. So you stay calm, but then there are other times like maybe where there's a lack of urgency and there needs to be urgency where you need to get a little bit excited about it and get people excited about it. And I think part of leadership is understanding like kind of when you need to do what, and you know, when you need to let the emotions fly or when you don't. And is that something for you ring that you started to really work on and notice when you became like a high level leader in the firm? Or is it something that you've always kind of felt you, you were able to do or that you tried to do? I, I credit a lot of that to the military training is my background. Um, having been in the service for uh, 25 years, um, I, I started out and actually I signed before I was senior in high school is, is when, I, when I first enlisted um, with a couple of different um, occup- uh, job specialties, if you will, and then eventually got commissioned as an officer in the, the military in 99. And through all of that, they – you learn again leadership styles from your leaders, right? You always learn from them just like you learn from your parents. You adapt things, is oh, you know what? I may not have done it this way. So, all of that is brought through that type of training. So, I credit a lot of this about military training because they teach you how to stay calm in panic. Um, mm-hmm. And you just kind of groom that, if you will, because every situation is different. As long as you remain calm, stick with the facts, leave the emotions out of the conversation, you tend to focus on the problem. It's when emotions, and you, you could probably argue this, you know, outside of the engineering spectrum. When emotions get involved in conversations, you tend to lose the facts of the conversation, what it is you're trying to, to solve. And so I try to, you know, not be emotionless, but try to remove those from those conversations. And, and I think that helps quite a bit. Yeah, for sure. And, and, I, and I, you know, I think the whole, what you were talking about with your your service in the military, I think is important because while I do think that there are some development programs that can be beneficial to help one like polish their leadership skills, I really think that all of our life experiences, you know, are shaping us into the leaders that we are. Military experience, being a parent, you know, being a coach, if you're an athletic coach or different things like that, they shape your leadership style that shows everywhere, at work, at home, whatever the case may be. So, I think that's something for those of you out there that if you think you're going to read a book or go to a course or something like that and become a better leader, I think it can help you. Um, But I really think your leadership style and your leadership abilities are the result of all of the life experiences that you have. And I personally think the more experiences you can give yourself, the more help it's going to be because, you know, you'll be more well-rounded. You'll have seen more things like I'm sure in rings military service, you saw a lot of different stuff. You were in a lot of different situations, which helps you to be able to, you know, navigate different types of situations. So, you know, and and I would also say for those of you out there that are maybe watching this video because you want to learn how to be a leader in engineering, you got to challenge yourself and you got to put yourself in situations where you can lead, whether it's, you know, joining an association and becoming the president or volunteering or volunteering for a committee in your organization, right? Um, So I would definitely challenge you to do that because, don't sit there and wait for a leadership course or a leadership training or for your firm to like invest in you. I mean, I hope they do that, but you know, you can create your own development um, by just doing it on your own and get some of point. You, you have to, you have to do that to, to be that well-rounded person because you're going to change as you grow your, your leadership style as a project manager will be different as you move up in an org- in any organization, those styles are going to change. Having those network groups help, because it's groups you can reach out to. Hey, I have a, a problem or this. How did you handle it if you had the same thing? And that gives you the different networking tools, which is which is helpful because no one does this by themselves. There's a team in everything that we do. 
and it's building that network and building that foundation, that group you can go to really helps uh, all the way across the board um, to your point. Yeah, for sure. So, so I want to talk a little bit about the, the new environment or the hybrid environment that we find ourselves in these days. I mean, some firms are still re- quite a bit remote. Some firms have a lot of people back in the office. Some firms are blend and some firms will be a blend maybe permanently at this point after this. And so talk a little bit about how, you know, your firm is approaching that um, and how you think it'll kind of affect the industry as we move forward together here. Working from home is here. It's, it's here to stay. I, I think it was, was coming before the pandemic. The pandemic, like many other things, accelerated things we hadn't thought about. Um, I'm more of a traditionalist, I'd say, and, and I'm more of people being in the office. Um, and it's more from a, a co- collaborative learning environment um, and for example, we're set up here, we have a bunch of cubicles and, and as you know, noise travels. So you can be having a conversation in one row of offices and the next row over, oh, I have that same problem, same issue. Hmm. And you begin to learn and collaborate. If you're working from home, you don't get that opportunity to, to do that. So I would say that we've been in the office since during the pandemic for the most part, we've allowed people to work from home, but for the most part, we're, we're, we're in the office slowly having a conversation to transition to work from home, just the way we were brought up in this industry. We've always been in the office. So for us, it's a little bit harder to, to, to get us over that edge. Mm. Everyone is different from work from home. You know, we're, we're more of a, a rural setting. So it, it's a little bit more difficult down, down this way as, as infrastructure catches up um, with, with different things. So depending on where you are in the nation, Kind of helped with the work from home aspect of things. Um, I think younger engineers, I'd probably argue, should be more in the office than working from home because they're the ones that need that molding and mentoring and everything else. Your experienced individuals will probably do more work from home because they have that experience, don't need that cooperation. But that's just something that's going to learn over time. And we talk to other companies in, in Delaware, some are more hybrid than others and, and different experiences, that kind of stuff. And it's here. The question is, how long is it going to take to fully take over? And what is that special to look like? Is it a three and two model, two and three model? Um, but it, it's here. It definitely, I think, more in, in the government side of things, you'll, you'll see it more um, in, in, the, in the engineering side. Like I said, I think it's still, still out there, um, what it's going to look like at the end of the day. But it, it's coming. There, there's no doubt about it. It's just how do we make it work? How do how does everyone be, stay effective? How does everyone continue to learn and grow? Going back to leadership, mentorship, you don't get the same, in my opinion, in a virtual environment as you do being in, in an office climate. Yeah, I, I totally agree with you. I mean, we've done some work with some firms to help them create kind of like their hybrid environment and their guidelines and stuff. And what I've seen in all of these firms is the ones that are successful with this, they have some kind of in-person touch points, whether it's a couple of days a week, like you mentioned, or you know, one day a week, the whole company's in another day a week, your whole team's in or something like that. Um, And I think really, what you said is the biggest concern that I would have about the, the, the remote working is the onboarding of, you know, new employees, regardless of their age or experience. Level. Yep. Because I think anytime you bring someone new into an organization, they've really got to learn kind of your way and your processes. And then I think, like you said, recent graduates, right, mentoring them. I mean, you know, I think the mentoring process, I know for me as a civil engineer, when I was, when I started and I was able to get in the field with people and see project sites and have conversations, you know, and so I do think that's invaluable. And I would encourage any firm out there to make sure that even if you do have a heavy remote schedule, get some mentoring time, in-person mentoring time with your younger staff, especially those that maybe are just going to become PMs is another example. If you want them to start managing projects and interacting with clients, they should watch you do that in person and live and see how it's done. I mean, that's the only way you can really learn. So I agree with Ring that the remote work is here to stay in some capacity, but I think if you manage it properly and create a good blend, again, going back to that word, you know, be adaptable, to be adaptable around it, right? I think that can really be beneficial in terms of how your firm grows, like for the long term. Absolutely. So, and, and that, oh, and, and that, that, so that's what the new students coming out of school are, are want. You know, they're used to that hybrid model through school and everything else. And then 
so that that's what you know again your your job market kind of dictates how you have to transition as well because because we're hearing a lot of that through interviews whatever else so to, to your point it, it's it's here it's, it's how does everyone mold it modify it and, and make it work yeah and i think that that right there is kind of what's going to dictate whether or not a firm can be successful and grow sustainably in this industry is or this uh, current atmosphere is you need to adjust and you need to be flexible to the different people within your firm. Like some of these people, like you said, they come out of school, they're just like ready for hybrid. I mean, that's what they're used to. However, there's people there that are 15, 20 years in and they're not used to hybrid really. I mean, they did it for a couple of years here, but they're not used to it. So I think it's like the leadership that can look at that and still create a good culture that takes into account different people's wants and needs is something that is important. And that kind of, I guess, dovetails into the next question. I think one of the things that's really been a focus in our industry is, you know, diversity and inclusion. Um, It's something that, you know, different perspectives, getting people involved in different things. Just wanted to get a little bit of your feel on that, your firm's feel on that, you know, your thoughts on that, how, how you can incorporate that into the growth of a firm. That, that's been a, a very key discussion we've had lately in, in the firm. How do, how do we do diversity, equity, inclusion? How do, how do we bring all that together? Because we are a diverse nation. We're a diverse community. How does a company become that diverse? And it, it's a challenge. I mean, the, the industry as a whole has been traditional white male. I mean, let's just not... not you know, sure. Be, be, be honest about it. So, so how do we break that mold? And that's the, the fun part and the key part. And you know, where does it begin? Does it begin in the, the elementary school system, middle school, high school system? Somewhere it begins because STEM has had a great momentum. I, again, I think the pandemic probably took us backwards a little bit from that, but STEM was picking up a lot of steam um, in the schools to get people excited about science, technology, engineering, and, and math. And, and how do we get other diversity into that that program and so we are an, an ace mentor and what it is okay. a mentor for architecture construction engineering students which represents 40 percent of those are, are female different minorities so through that we're, we're that's how we're trying to impact becoming more diverse um because doing that that helps remove biases in some of the decisions we make some of the designs that we make it makes everyone feel included, won't be part of that, that solution in that, that group. So it's something that we've em- embraced. Your location of your company, those, those kind of things will make it a little more difficult, you know, to, to have that diversity. And in, in an inner city is probably a little bit easier because it's definitely more diverse. And, and like you get out into some of the, the rural areas, it's a little bit more difficult because that, that area it is. So your, your demographics obviously has an impact on, on sure. how diverse and, and equitable you can be. But at the end of the day, we're looking for staff like everyone else is that wants to be part of a team, part of a solution, regardless of whatever. We're looking for that right, right person, right fit. Sure. No, that's great. And I think, I think a couple of points there that you make are important is that the, you know, one of the things is a function of the industry, right? And like, there's only so many people that are out there that are engineers or technical professionals that as a firm, you know, that you're able to hire from or that you're able to find people out of in terms of like um, the, the, the talent pool that's out there. And I think to make a change to that, you have to go deeper, like you said, into the school system and start to get into elementary schools and high schools if we want to change that talent pool. Because you can only hire the people that are experienced that have an engineering degree or whatever the case may be. And so that's why some of these programs, and I know, I think the ACE mentor program is a great program. And by the way, that's a nationwide program for those of you out there, you can probably find something local and you can contribute to that program. And they set up meetings where, you know, you can mentor young professionals on what engineering is. So um, I think it's great that, you know, ring your firms involved in that. And I would encourage people to get involved with that. I know ASCE also has like their foundation that does Mm -hmm. a lot of stuff for schools and they've done the dream big movie and things of that nature. So I think we have to work with some of these associations because they can set up the programs, but it's the actual engineering professionals that they're going to need to get out there and to meet people and talk to kids. And the thing about it is that the engineering, the civil engineering industry is a very exciting industry. So if we could just get it in front of kids and show them what we do, um, I think that's really the hardest part is just getting in front of them. Once you're in front of them, I think you're really going to wow them with the types of projects that we work on. So I definitely think that's a huge part of DEI for us in civil engineering. 
So Ring, in terms of infrastructure, mm -hmm. right now, it's a time in our country where infrastructure is failing. We all know that. The, the country knows that, which is why they recently uh, approved the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act, which is going to bring a lot of dollars to different to all the states across the country over time. So what do you think the impact of that legislation is going to have on our industry? What do you see if you're kind of looking ahead and what are you bracing for? It's going to have a huge impact. As you mentioned, the infrastructure is it's old. It's really good. I mean, Back to the 1930s, right, is when, when a, a bulk of the infrastructure was built in the 1930s, part of the Great Depression. Um, so here we are 90 years later, right, well past the useful life, if you look at what, what useful life is supposed to be. So um, it's going to have a great impact on the industry. The, the challenge is on the industry itself, but the talent point and everything else, how do we meet that challenge to improve that infrastructure to allow the dollars to go as far as we can get the dollars to go? And, and it's beyond just what we normally think about water, sewer, roads, and bridges. There's um, electric grid. As we talk more about electric vehicle markets and getting the grid to be able to support those type of markets, uh, you get into internet, right, with, with all the different things. Mm -hmm. So there's many different things out there that's going to have a huge effect on and while we do this and we think about <clears throat> how do we have longevity and what we're going to do, but one thing I thought about literally as we're just in this conversation is I just said 90 years ago, we did it once before we're here 90 years later. What do we do? So we don't have another 90 years from now we're in the same boat of everything's failing. How do we do this? So it becomes a systemic maintenance item throughout that we're not always just rebuilding every 90 years, but we keep going through it. Maybe that is the cycle, just like an economy. Maybe there's a cycle because it's hard to do that at the end of the day, but our industry or, or our firm, we do a little bit of municipal work more local level than we do state level, everything else. So um, we'll see the impact from our firm itself. We won't see it as much you know, from, from what we do as we help municipalities out you know, here in, in Delaware. Most of our infrastructure is least roads is with DelDOT state kind of things. We don't have the, the, the real local levels like other states like New Jersey, Pennsylvania have. So we'll see it a little bit, you know, your, your bigger states will see it much more because they have much more infrastructure and everything else. But I think it's huge for the industry. It's things that uh, we're part of ACEC um, that has been discussing for years about how to do this. And, and so I think it's fantastic. Um, as long as we get spread it over time and not try to shoehorn everything into three or four years, um, at the end of the day, we want good, sustainable designs to last for generations to come. Yeah, great point. I think sometimes we think about getting the design going and getting these projects rolling and we want to get through them quickly and meet the meet the schedule guidelines, but we have to remember that the design, the quality of the design drives the long-term maintenance and success of the projects overall. So that, that's a really good point. All right, so let's switch gears a little bit now. I'm going to ask you a couple of questions that I often get from civil engineering professionals. The first one is, what is the number one trait that you feel is important for civil engineering professionals to have today? Self-discipline. In and, and this, and this day and age, you've got to have the self-discipline um, because not everything's given to you. you. You have your own schedules, you have your own designs, and you can quickly, if you don't have the discipline, you can quickly fall behind in your schedule. Your design can come out of, out of scope um, because in this industry, as you will know, it's ever-changing. Mm. The, the, the process is the same or similar, but every day is different. And it's having that self-discipline to stay focused, to get things done. And, and so we're in a multitasking world where you can quickly lose focus trying to do a multitask versus solving that one task for the day and move on to something else. So it's that self-discipline. And it's not only for design world, but it's, it's as a professional staying self-discipline, improving yourself through continuing education, um, staying in the know with different things going on, asking questions. That's all part of the whole self-discipline that, that I think is key to any new engineer coming in. Is you have that, you put in a work ethic, you will achieve whatever it is that you want to achieve, even though you may not even know that you want to be the president. You, right. you will have that ability to achieve those goals, um, even though they may not be written in your one, you may find it going down the road. Yeah, I like that a lot, especially in the world we live in, like we talked about before, where you might be working from home now. 
um, which also creates a need for more self-discipline because there are more distractions, you know, there are more distractions with social media and other things going on today. So I think the ability to stay disciplined, stay focused on your goals is really important. And I think that if you're a leader in the industry, you know, helping your team and reminding them of that is important because, you know, they might get distracted. So I think that can be a really important trait. Another question that we get a lot from civil engineering professionals ring is how can I make sure that I'm adding value to my organization? You add value by staying involved is how you add value to that um, organization. You want to feel like you have an impact, right? We all want to want to have an impact that we've, we've made something deposit. So, so the question is, how do you, you do that? So you stay in, involved. Um, there may be some companies have leadership councils, so you get involved in that. You get involved in some outreach efforts. Um, internships are a great way to get involved to help one to support internships because, again, you're trying to encourage others to become you. Um, and the internships are valuable, not only from that standpoint, but they're valuable for the intern itself, the company itself, because it's, it's a, a, a quote unquote free interview, if you will, you're allowed to interview it, itself. So those are different ways to help add value to organization. And that value is going to change, obviously, over time. Your, your value as a young engineer first coming in will be a different value as you move up, become a project manager, and then ultimately a, a leader. So it goes back to what we were saying from the beginning, being adaptable, learning. Never stop learning. You know, We may not be learning in a textbook anymore. We're learning life. And that's how you continue to add value by design, by doing that. Because as soon as you become stagnant, we're done. You're done as an individual. You're done as a company. You're done as an organization. You can never stay stagnant. And that's the, always the question is, is, how do we not stay stagnant? And I think that's really where the value comes into play. Yeah, and I liked like your initial, you know, kind of gut reaction to that question is get involved, right? I think if you're getting involved and in doing all the things you talked about, you're going to be creating value for your firm. Um, and I would say too, to be vocal with your leader or your supervisor, you know, how can I get involved? Where can I help? Which kind of leads me into my next question, which is if someone came up to you ring from your, that worked in your firm and said, Hey, you know, listen, ring, I really want to help out here. What is, what is one of the biggest challenges we're having right now at DBF that if I could help solve that challenge, it really, you know, change the game for our company. How would you answer that question? Our, our challenge right now, and it's probably an issue wide, is skill shortage, trying to, to find the right, right talent. Um, let's be honest, when you come out of school, you're dangerous. School taught you just enough to get in trouble. And, and it, it's learning those skills at, at work or in the job is, is the critical part of things and having the right leader, mentor teach you those things. Um, what I get nervous about is um, learning engineering judgment is, is where I kind of get, get nervous about where, you know, we, we learn to design the books. We've learned to design to spreadsheets. We've learned to design to, I mean, we, we've got tools out there that design a whole subdivision for you. Um, but sometimes that engineering judgment needs to come into play. So that, 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 that skill shortage that we're, we're talking about is, is those two things is, is where I think the, the, the biggest challenge exists overall. And then that skill shortage is, is probably the, where my concern. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. And it goes back to what we talked about before a little bit, getting out into the schools, because there just is a shortage in terms of the talent pool, for sure. And then we've got this infrastructure funding coming, which is probably going to make it even harder now. Um, but I do like what you said there about the engineering judgment, because to me, that's where the mentoring really needs to come into play, because it's one of those things where like, you don't really get taught engineering uh, judgment, maybe engineering ethics in school, like one class, but not engineering judgment. And I think that it's one of those things that you can't just necessarily learn on the job. I mean, you can, but you, you don't want to mess that up type of thing. So I think if you can learn it watching someone and being a mentor to someone or an intern for a couple of years, that can help with that learning curve when you get out there and you actually have to do it yourself. And I, I remember for myself, when I got my engineering license, I was excited about it, but I was also a little bit nervous because, you know, there's a lot of like power and responsibility that comes with being a licensed professional and, you know, there's a lot of liability, quite frankly, as well. And so you need to be aware for you and your firm. And so I think you need to be aware of what that means. Um, and definitely anything you could do to learn about that from an experienced professional is going to be going to be helpful for you. All right, I just got a couple of last questions for you, Ring. 
in terms of, you know, as the president, there's lots of things that you got to think about. How do you kind of decide what you're going to work on each day? What does that process look like for you? Chaos. <laughs> every, every, every day is different. You, you go into the day with, with one to-do list and it's going to change. Things come up that you don't, don't plan on. So it goes back to what I said at the very beginning. It's adaptability. How do you adapt throughout the day? Um, and so every, it goes back to every day is different, but it's the same. Um, so it's kind of hard to answer you know, that, that question because, because as the president, multiple things come to you all the time. Whereas when you're, you're a young engineer designer, you had that one project to work on. <clears throat> as you move up the company, you know, those that watch it, it's going to change because different factors come to you. You know, we, someone called out sick this day. Okay. We're going to make this adjustment or, Hey, can you go here for this thing? So it's always being adaptable and adjustable. And, and that's the key part to the, to the job is being adaptable, being there for your staff and your clients. Because at the end of the day, that's what they've hired you to do is to help solve their problem or help them with their project. Right. So you might have a loose idea of a couple of things you want to get done, but you're very open to the fact that you're going to get hit with a bunch of things each day and you're going to have to deal with them and navigate them. You're going to have to be. That, that, that's correct. Yeah. Um. Another question I have for you, is there, whether it was a book or a person or a, um, a seminar, something that made an in, a real in, lasting impact on you in terms of, you know, your leadership style or the way that you've grown in your career that has stuck with you? There's not a particular book or, or anything like that. I've, I've been fortunate in, in the, the few organizations I've worked in to have individuals that had an impact one way or another um, in my life. And, and so I've learned from their styles and I've, I've adapted their styles, you know, because as a young engineer, I know you mostly talk to other colleagues, so maybe a superior one level up, you didn't really go talk to the, to the top president of the office. And as you move in organization, you start to meet more and more people. So those, there's not one particular thing I can say that I've, I've learned from it. it. It's just learning from others and, and, Oh, I like what this person does, I like what this person does. Oh, this book had a great idea. And you kind of mold them together to, again, adapt and change that style over time. Because what worked 10 years ago isn't going to work today. It's not going to work 10 years from now. And, and so that's where that adaptability, that's where, you know, um, the professional continuing education, all those things come to play. Is That's what allows you, to, again, to stay relevant and viable um, to the organization to yourself. That's great. All right, Ring, the last question that I have for you here is I know we've been talking about mentoring a little bit and seeking guidance from others. When you get to the stage in your career, you know, you're president of a company, you know, how do you go about still trying to do that? Or do you talk to other presidents or leaders in the industry? Like, how do you keep learning from others that have done with you what you've done or they're kind of facing the similar types of challenges? Because you, you said yourself, you know, you got to keep learning and keep growing. So what does that process look like for you at this stage? At this stage, it's talking to other uh, companies, their leadership, um, attending various state organizations to stay involved in the community to, to learn what's going on. Um, so that that's kind of the, the path forward at this point in time. Again, it's still reading. Uh, there's still books out there to, to help with those kind of things. But it's, it's, again, it's talking to your, your peers about what are they going through and, and those kind of things. So it's still staying Again, staying involved in the community, staying involved in the engineering world, talking to your, your competitors who are going through the same thing. And, and we all work together because at the end of the day, we all want the same solution, what's best for everybody at the end of the day, best for the engineering world, because that's what we're promoting is engineering and everything that we do. That's great. All right. Ring Lardner, President at Davis, Bone, and Friedel, I want to thank you. I thank you for your service to our country. Thank you for coming on the the show here and sharing some of your advice with the professionals out there. I really appreciated talking with you. No, thank you very much. I really enjoyed myself today and had a great time. And thank you very much. I hope you enjoyed my conversation with Ring. I totally agree with his sentiment that we need to be adaptive in our careers. Our firms need to be adaptive in the atmosphere that we're in today. And as an industry, we need to be adaptive because we need to find more talented professionals to come join us to help with our infrastructure and other engineering needs that we have. Please consider subscribing to our channel here. We put out videos like this on a weekly basis to help engineering professionals become better managers and leaders. I'll see you next week.